You're not nervous, are you, James? I'm nervous. <laughs> I am. At least a live audience. So, um, before we start, I understand that lots of people have taken time to take pictures with James. <laughs> but in case you feel like you haven't seen him close enough, <laughs> This is now going to stay in the background no, for the rest not. of the session. No. <laughs> yes. Click that button. No, 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 it is staying. <laughs> he promised me he wouldn't do that. Can we please? Oh, it's so horrible. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, right. so um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for coming back from lunch. And uh, this is very much a formal Q&A. And we'll do a few chit chats. And then we'll open it up to the floor. Uh, so you can ask any questions, keep them polite. He's not going home with you. Don't ask <laughs> questions like that. Uh, so, James, I, I'll give you, tell you a little story about James. So I first met, uh, so James Norton is one of those guys that most blokes find really irritating. <laughs> <laughs> because you look at them from far and go like, that's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> It's unfair, and then you end up with going like, he's not really that good looking. <laughs> the only problem with that plan is, so I first met him at the JDRF event, and I think below the alleged good looks, there's actually a very, very nice gentleman who, uh, what I enjoyed talking to him about was his passion about type 1 diabetes, how he wanted to help, how he wanted to show that type 1 diabetes isn't a barrier in life, you can do so many things. So, um, and uh, we have been trying to chase James Norton, and he's busy, evidently something about James Bond. Or something. <laughs> um, but generally speaking, uh, it's our great fortune to actually have you here today, which is, uh, so thank you very much for that. So um, without further ado, uh, James, tell us a little bit about yourself. Wow, what a question. Uh, that was a lovely ball. Uh, we had a little spark at that ball, I have to say, reciprocated. I know, just, I know. Yeah. It was, we had, we it had was close. Yeah, a few glasses of champagne down, I think. Um, <laughs> So thank you for having me, and um, I've never been to TAD before, and it's all, I, I'm a total convert. It's a wonderful event, the warmth and energy in this room. Um, I only caught the end of Sam's speech, and my apologies that I wasn't here this morning. Um, I, I can start with the best disclaimer ever, but my little sister, who is also type 1, and my mum is also type 1, so we're a family of type 1s, she gave birth uh, yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so she was going to originally be here today with me, and we were going to do a sort of brother-sister chat, but um, unfortunately, she selfishly had the baby. Too early. <laughs> so she's with little Kit, who's 10 pounds something. Yeah. C-section, as you'd imagine. But um, that's where I was this morning with her and with my new nephew. Um, so that gives you a little bit about myself. I'm... Um, uh, uh, well, I'm an actor. I, um, I am a type 1 and a proud type 1. Um, I was diagnosed in, when I was 22. My little sister was diagnosed when she was 9, and my mum was diagnosed when she was 58. So we have a whole cross-section of diagnoses. My dad is the weird one who's <laughs> normal. And uh, he feels very left out most meals when we're sitting there discussing our sugar levels or claiming the last brownie or whatever. He has no claim to any of it. Um, and... Yeah, it's been, it was a, well, I mean, we can talk, we can talk everything, we can talk diabetes and everything else, you guys know it's, it's a rocky ride at the beginning, and then with the support of my little sister, and then later on, her and I were able to support my mum, we've got a little unit of care, and it's lovely, you know, we do, um, we rely on each other, and we're constantly sort of going on holiday and forgetting our needles, and sending, you know, postage packages across the world to each other, and it's nice, it's, a, it's a definitely a lovely thing to be able to support each other and normalize it, and um, that's what this is about, isn't it? Coming together and having a community of people. So, um, yeah, that's my diabetic life. My life, is, is, my career is um, wonderful and weird and stressful and exciting and has odd compromises along the way, but does allow me to come to places like this and meet all you wonderful people, so um, I'm very lucky in that regard. It doesn't come without its challenges, particularly from the type one point of view, and I know hearing Sam talk about, I mean, I can't compare to be a professional cyclist, but there are certain um, challenges which uh, being an actor throws up, the travel, the time zones constantly shifting, 
the constant sort of hit, kicks of adrenaline. Um, uh, but generally, I'm, I'm pretty good and okay. And uh, my Dexcom recently has slightly changed my life. Um, and uh, I still jab. I'm not on a pump. So I'm still on the old school Nova Rapid Atlantis. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I jab a lot. I kind of, you know, I'm, a, I'm very open about my jabbing. I'm not those, you know, I constantly will sort of be on the tube and realize that it's my stop and I'll have my needle and I'll be running down the platform. <laughs> um, but I'm, um, yeah, I've always sort of lived by that mantra that, um, well, we, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But that's, that's me in a nutshell, anyway. Okay, um, so with type 1 diabetes as a background, you've had it since 22, and right now you're, what, 21? <laughs> I am, I am. Um, how, how does it work out for you? I mean, in the sense, with your career, with all the demands, do you, do you find, is there any incidents which you find which were hilarious, but at the same time, good learning lessons? I mean, I'm sure there must be plenty of things like that. So the way I manage is, like everyone, you know, life throws up its trials and tribulations along the way, and I think acting obviously makes it slightly more unpredictable. Um, I manage, as I say, through being very open and, uh, and proud of it, and I, you know, talk about it with everyone, so everyone, most people on my film set or, or in the theatre know exactly what it is and what it requires, so... Um, you know, there's always some AD or runner who has my carton of orange juice and some, you know, I have to say, James needs his juice, and then it kind of ripples around and <laughs> occasionally they have to stop filming, but that's just the way it rolls. Um, uh, and, you know, the technology, as we all know, as it gets better and better, has been a massive improvement. I mean, there was a time when I would be, um, particularly when you're doing a play and you're on stage for an hour or so, I mean, I met a couple of actors in here and they know. Um, in fact, I forgot the lady doing the, the show this afternoon. Jade. Jade. I mean, Jade's about to do an hour of intense uh, theatre, and you know she's going to have to get those sugar levels going the right way with the right arrow. Um, things like Dexcom and Libra have radically um, changed my life in that regard and made it so much easier to control. Um, I, I I do what you guys do. I have my juice here always. I have um, I have if I'm on the stage, I have bits of sugar. It's distributed everywhere, so no one knows this. But I, you know, if I'm doing a period thing, I always stitch in a little pocket in my wherever it is for my Dextro tablets. And if I do go low on stage, I'll sort of, I don't know, find a window and kind of look at it, and then you know, you'll see. <laughs> and that's that's happened more than you didn't know. It's mad. Like I've constantly had to, you know, deal with a, um, a hypo on stage. Um, so yeah, I have to make sure that everyone knows, and I'm open about it, and I very, uh, you know, on the first day, because obviously my colleagues are changing all the time, so on the first day I find the boss and I say, listen, type one, this is the rule, if I need to eat, I need to eat, and they go, cool, um, and um, they you know, don't make a big too, too fuss about it, but I'm, I'm open and honest, and, um, and then I do all the precautions required, so I have my sugars here, I have, you know, if there's a fridge on set, I'll have a, you know, a Coke or a juice in there, and... I mean, there have, been, there have been some hairy moments. Um, I was telling someone earlier, I'm repeating myself, but um, there was one show I, I did where um, I, it was Journey's End. I don't know if any of you know the play. It's a very intense uh, play about the First World War, and it's all in a dugout. And this is this character, Stan Up. He doesn't really, he, there's about a 45 minute section in the middle where he doesn't leave, and he's very angry all the time. So he's kind of you know, railing at the world, and it's very kind of animated and violent and aggressive. And uh, the night before, I was talking to one of my cast members, and he was like, what is a hypo? I was like, well, it's this thing, you know, it's when the balance slightly goes off, you know, skewed, and um, the symptoms are sort of, I get a bit sweaty, and I, you know, get a little bit feverish, and I just need to sort of take a beat, get some sugar on board, and I'm fine. And he's like, cool. Anyway, the following day, I was having a really great night playing stand-up. I was like, you know, sometimes in theatre, nights go really well, sometimes they're hopeless, but this was a great night, and I was sweating, and I was shaking, and I was red in the face, and this guy, Simon, was like, oh my gosh, James is hypo, like, this is dangerous, so he runs backstage when he leaves, I'm not allowed to leave, because my scenes are going on for an hour, he runs backstage, tells the backstage crew that I'm hypoing, and they're like, what do we do, pandemonium breaks loose backstage, <laughs> I'm on the stage having a great night, anyway, then the, one of the cast members starts to improvise these scenes where he's like, uh, cup of tea, sir, cup of tea. <laughs> Full of Lucas, eh? And I'd, and I'd be there taking these Lucas, they going, what on earth is going on? And then I looked around, I looked around the dugout, and all the actors who had come in and out of this scene which I was in had started to like surreptitiously lay biscuits. 
little biscuits and sweets all over the table. <laughs> At which point, obviously, in my head, I'm like, well, I've clearly hypoed. I mean, I, I must have missed a scene, or I'm like falling. I don't know. So, yeah, you know, as we all know, there are moments like that which are wonderful and fun and funny. And, um, and touch wood, I haven't, you know, fallen off the front of the stage quite yet, but um, touch wood. Thank you. Um, what, um, so I think before we open up to questions, I mean, I uh, had one question, one personal question. Yeah, yeah, we can have a drink later. Yeah, no <laughs> Any time. Thanks, man. This is a pro proper bromance. Yeah. Um, yeah, that will happen, but it's fine. Um, sorry, I've lost my chain. <laughs> You're so charming. <laughs> um, so the question I had was, what, there's a lot of people in the audience of different age groups, um, and it was lovely to see you speaking to a lot of people, and especially the kids in the audience. Uh, what, what message uh, would you give uh, to them? And what's, what's your sort of take-home message that they're going to go away from here? What, what would you leave them with? So I was thinking about this on my bike on the way here. Um, because, you know, you get these, I remember when I got diagnosed and the, the consultant was very much sort of, you know, the, all these mantras and things, which are really important and we should all hold on to them, you know, don't let it control you, you control it and all these things. And I live by those and absolutely, but I think what I've realized, I've come to realize in the last, I'm 33, so I've had it for over a decade. And the older I get and the, the further away I get away from that moment of, you know, it's traumatic, it's trauma, it's really, it's a horrible moment when you find out, but then, that sort of is put in the past. And now I'm in this place where I kind of, I own it and I, and I love it. Like I, I, I think, what I, I was talking, I think in my head about one word we use a lot in, um, in acting is empathy. And we, our currency is empathy. In order to play a role, you have to love the person you're playing. You know, you have to celebrate difference. You have to be inquisitive about people and places and that's what it's like being a journalist, you know. And there's something about being a diabetic where you're a little bit different, but as a result, you're a hell of a lot more interesting. And uh, having had that thing attached to me, this, the fact that I'm a type one, I immediately feel like I'm much more empathetic. And I know, and I hear people with their small differences, and I immediately tune in, and, and I understand it, whether it's a health concern or it's an anxiety they have, or uh, whatever it might be. Empathy is a wonderful thing, and if being a type one means that we're all a little bit more empathetic, then that's a wonderful thing. And so I feel, as I get older, I'm more and more proud, actively proud, owning it. I feel, when I see a type one, I know you guys are the same, when you see someone on the tube, you're like, hi, and you grab them. <laughs> and I mean, also, let's be honest, like, type ones are always fantastic people. Like, when have you ever <laughs> met a bad type one? You know, we're all, we're all wonderful, and it's because we have that little element of um, empathy and we're a little bit different, and we celebrate difference. Um, and so I think that's my message. I think it's, you know, once, once you've got over that horrible period of discombobulation and tra trauma and, you know, you recover and you take that breath, then actually see it as a wonderful thing. It's, a, it, it's what makes the fabric and tapestry of, of humanity so interesting, all these little differences, and this is ours, and it's fantastic. So before I open it up to the floor, the obvious question is, which is nothing to do with type 1 diabetes, uh, which is if you had a choice of a role uh, you would like to play, not a Bond, forget that, right? <laughs> right? Not him. Okay, not him. Right. Although I have to say, wouldn't it be great to have a type 1 Bond? I'm just saying. Yeah. You know what I mean? It'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? When he's with Q and he pulls out some weird injection, it's actually like that. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I, uh, I hear petitions are quite the vogue nowadays. I mean, we might run one, yeah? We could start something. <laughs> okay, so the question I had, so forgetting that, is there any particular character you'd like to play from the, obviously from the Marvel universe? <laughs> I'm actually, what do you see yourself as? What do I see myself as? I'm actually not, a, I'm not up on my Marvel, so I... <laughs> okay, thank, but, thank you very much for coming. Sorry. It was... Uh, <laughs> Well, I've got it. Obviously, there has to be a superhero, which is in some way their, you know, type one related superpower. I mean, there has to be. I mean, there has yeah. to be. The, that, that would be obviously my, my pitch to the Marvel Universe is that. Um, I don't know. You got you got T one on my, my spandex. You got very square jaws. 
What is Captain America? To... You know, I don't. I okay. don't ask her to do So I think Captain America, that sort of role would suit you. All right, a T1 Captain that. America. If you need any help with your career, we're here. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for all the Q&A and etc. I'm going to throw it up to the audience for any questions you might have. Somebody needs to give me a sense check on the time we have left. Fantastic. We got a good seven, eight minutes at least. So, questions to James from the audience. Yep. <laughs> wait, wait, don't... Uh, Go on. <laughs> Please. Um, so, I'm an actor as well, and obviously, I find when I'm performing or just in my life in general, my emotions really affect my blood sugar. Obviously, as an actor, you go through this whole stream of emotions, and it really does send you all over the Before you answer that, so for the benefit of the recording, I'll just repeat that question so it goes on the recording. So the question is, uh, emotions obviously plays quite a bit of havoc with your blood sugar readings. Is there any particular role you played emotionally that has also caused quite a bit of changes with your diabetes control, right? Can we please get rid of that picture? <laughs> I, I don't have one of you, it's really unfair. Okay, hands up, who wants the picture oh, to no. go away? All right, I'll just... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it just, right. we really follow the public in these sort of events. <laughs> and, you know, as a doctor, I'm always told one thing, listen to, to the, the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am not going to change that. All right. So. Um, <laughs> um, so what traumatic experience, this is pretty traumatic, um, having this guy behind me. Um, it does definitely pay havoc, the adrenaline and the emotion, you know, and often, and, you know, that, like that journey's end anecdote. I mean, it, it, it was crazy because I didn't leave the stage for 45 minutes and it was a really intense role. And that was way before Libra and Dexcom. And so, you know, I was kind of at sea. Um, uh, how does one do it? I mean, you kind of get, you, you get into a rhythm. You, you, um, you make sure that every time you're going on stage, you're at that seven or or creeping up, you know, somewhere the arrow is going to go in half. Um, you know, sometimes you might be crashing just before you go on stage, and you know, you just have to take that hit down a thing of smoothie, and you know, you'll probably go a little bit high towards the interval, but then you know, you recalibrate, and um, so you know, I think like everyone in life, I mean, gosh, you think about someone like Theresa May. I mean, how on earth is she keeping her sugars? <laughs> have you ever seen her do any of that <laughs> ever? <laughs> She's not on, she's on Libra, so she's not got someone with her. I mean, I don't know how she does it. And her emotions must be going, well, you know, you know what ours are like, and we're not the one. Anyway, um, I think you just, you just get patterns, and, and, and um, uh, you learn the way emotion and adrenaline affects your body. So, you know, you know how much you need to give it. It's a bit like going on a, there's nothing like going on a cycle race, I understand. <laughs> but, you know, you just, you, you, after a few shows, because, you know, you do these shows 200 times. So what I usually end up doing is eating exactly the same thing at exactly the same time and knowing that that particular scene will spike me there and, l and lower me there. And then by the end of it, you're on a kind of, you know, you're on a very, very regimented pattern, I guess. Okay. Any other questions? Liz. Related to that, how, how do you deal with the Dexcom alarms? So question yes. is, how do you deal with the Dexcom alarms when you're on stage? Well, I have never had Dexcom whilst I've been on stage, so good question. Uh, the last play I did, I was still on Libra, and I would obviously have it uh, at my the, the, the place I would enter and exit the most, and I would swipe away. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm actually a, a musician, a singer, and, and I sleep my mind. I'm so, so scared of it going off. Yeah. Well, I make, I make sure that all the alerts are on vibrate, and then the urgent alert, I guess, you know, it's the same thing on a film set, because, you know, if you've got a really important scene, and you've got one take, and you've got a drone and an explosion or whatever, and you mess it up with a beep. <laughs> well, know, so I make sure all the vibrate alerts can I, are on. Can I just say, it could actually work if you played R2-D2. <laughs> <laughs> Typecast forever, playing a robot. It's a good role. Yeah. OK, questions? Any other questions? Can I see any hands? Polite questions? Yes? I, I, I have um, a, a question that my, my daughter would love to ask. Her favourite actor is Hugh Damon. Yes. And um, so, what was it like working with Paul? And, <laughs> <laughs> and have you got any heroes in the acting profession? 
She's made so this. Paul Danum, how is it to work with Paul Danum? And who's your acting hero? How do you make this about diabetes? Uh, I'm trying to think of a slight curve into... So, um, just, just so I once sat with Paul in Vilnius and I did an injection and, let, and Paul Dano is a lovely guy. Um, that's perfect, that's a little segue into Paul. Um, he's a lovely, lovely, lovely man and he's um, a very serious and committed actor and, and actually also he... Because the thing about my industry is there's some occasionally, and it's not often, but occasionally you meet people who do take themselves too seriously. And it's exhausting because, you know, they have a lot of noise and a voice and, and you know, people who take themselves too seriously are annoying anyway, let alone actors, because they can just, you know. Um, Paul is the complete opposite. He's just so talented and respected, and yet he's like a kid, you know. He, 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 I think what, he constantly is pulling pranks and sending inappropriate texts, and, you know, we have... <laughs> Like this, we have this app on our phone, which is like my fart app. Anyone got the fart app? <laughs> really good. You know, Paul and I would have a lot of fun. I mean, that, that's how childish it gets. So I'm pr he's probably going to hate me for saying that. But um, he's a lovely, lovely, sweet man, an amazing actor, a hero of mine now, having worked with him, and a friend. And that's the best combination. And as far as my own heroes, gosh, I mean, there are lots. Um, one person who you wouldn't expect me to say is Richard Wilson. One Foot in the Grave, uh, he directed me once in my second professional job ever, and it was an absolute dream. I don't think I've ever worked with as good a director since, and he's a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and um, I love him dearly, and, uh, but yeah, not the Tom Hiddlestons. I mean, yeah, Tom is a great man, but Richard... <laughs> Richard Wilson is Sorry, is, is, can I just, the next, is there a bit of rivalry between you and Tom? No, Tom and I are friends. <laughs> Tom and I... <laughs> Tom and I are, very, are good friends and old friends. He's good. Uh, so just for the audience, are you going to bring Tom next year? In fact, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yeah, sorry, yes, please. Jen? Um, there's 22 weeks left of the way you've been acting. Is there ever a moment in the cast dining before something that way you thought maybe this year wouldn't be happening? So let me repeat that question again. So, diagnosed at 22, pivotal time in somebody's life when you're going into career. Did you feel that because of the age of diagnosis, your career might change or you may not get to where you want to get to? Is that something that happened with you? That's a good question. Um, I, I can honestly say no. I never even, even considered it. I, I, um, I think it's probably because I was lucky enough to have a little sister who is formidable and amazing. She's two years younger than me, but she's so much more sorted than I am. She's got a lovely husband. She's just had a baby. She, they're both doctors. Um, you know, they took, they went, made the sensible choice and took a sensible career and, you know, they have um, uh, stability and um, sanity um, and, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> me, well, I mean, the actors well, are... No, what, sanity? Well, as in compared to an actor who just, you know, I'm the mad, the silly one of the family, you know, and so to see her from the age of nine, deal with it so well and um, be so strong, you know. And I remember the horrible moments, like when she was, she was at boarding school and one of the matrons told her to go to the loo and do her jab because it was upsetting the other girls. And my sister, who's just like, absolutely not. And my mum then comes in and says, you know, and like has a huge row with that lady. So seeing wonderful, my mum, my dad, my sister, um, I already had an amazing example of how to do it and how not to let it affect your life in the wrong way and only let it affect your life in the right way, as you were saying. As Sam was saying, so um, she was an amazing example. Um, I think it's different as well. It's, it's a little bit different if you get diagnosed later on because your body's kind of found its feet and you've found that equilibrium. You know, it was definitely harder for my little sis. I remember being with her, you know, we would, I'm two years older, so we would go to some parties together and, you know, we were just starting drinking and things. And, you know, we'd put way before the Dexcom and the, the Libra, and we'd come back, and I remember sort of, her sugars being sky high and not knowing what to do about it and freaking out that mum was going to find out. And I remember one night, I was about 17 and she was 15, and we decided that in the, like two in the morning, kind of pretty drunk, we decided that we would be good for her to go on a run to bring her sugar. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously I was like, I'm not going to run. So I sat at the bottom of the hill and, she, and I was like with a watch going, keep going, keep going. And she'd run. <laughs> um, and obviously exercise makes your sugar levels go higher anyway. So at the end of this ridiculous this, you know, complete um, farce. We checked her sugars and she'd gone up five units. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it, well, I guess I'm, I'm, it was harder for her, 
But to see her do it with such grace and strength meant that, for me, it was, it was a complete shock when I found out I was diabetic, but it was also totally fine, because I looked at her and I went, I can live a totally normal life and you know, be anything I want to be, because my little sister has already shown that I can do that. Thank you very much. I think we're going to call it to a close uh, to get everything back on time. So um, a massive, massive thank you from me. And uh, I think, as I said to the audience, we have had a good Q&A and lots of banter and stuff. But I, uh, as, I've, as I've said at the very beginning, it has been an absolute pleasure knowing you. Uh, and it's been good to see. I think it's very important. We have role models with type 1 diabetes come out. And as I said at the very beginning of the day, if we want to change type 1 diabetes care, the actual power sits with the people who have type 1 diabetes. And I think you are a very good role model for that, so. Thank you, but I also would add, we're gonna have a little sort of self-congratulation, people like yourself, and I'm not sure if anyone has, I missed this morning, if Toasted Partha and his team and the people who put this together, but it is such an important event. And you know, I joke, T1s are all fantastic. I mean, I don't, don't joke, it's true. But um, getting them together, on the one hand is great because we just get to hang out with great people, but also to have these events, you know, I was lucky enough to have my sister and my mum there throughout, and we had our own little kind of support care network, but so many people today have already said to me how wonderful it is to just come and talk, and you know, and through this community, people like yourself, amazing people like yourself, bringing us all together, we are so strong together, and we can get man Matt Hancock to, you know, make sure Dexcon is available to everyone, which is, as we all know, the key, you know. Um, so. Yeah, long may these types of events continue. People like yourself pioneering them. Yeah, it's great. I'm so happy to be here, and I can't wait to see you next year. It's the best. Uh -huh. <laughs>